Hello, LMC students. My name is Jared Walker, and as you may know, I am the Executive VP of Academic Affairs here at Legacy Ministry College. Uh, I'm excited to share the word of the Lord for you in this uh, new year. Uh, turn in your Bible, if you have it, your Bible app, whatever you're reading, uh, to Matthew 11 and verse uh, 25. Definitely want to start off with the word of God here. Um, so Matthew 11, 25. Uh, and we're going to read all the way down to verse 30. It, it goes, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Wow, what a powerful invitation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there is so much to unpack here. Uh, I probably want to focus on verses 28 to 30, uh, but I did include verses 25 to 27 because I do think the context adds adds to the point that uh, I want to make. Uh, starting in verse 28, however, is that wonderful invitation, come to me, come to me. Who is he calling? Who is he inviting? Uh, all who are weary and burdened. He's not calling the proud and the self-confident and the self-righteous. He's not calling the ballers and the big timers. He's calling those who are weary and burdened and worn out and they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And and it's, it's so this this is going out to not just to his disciples, really to anyone within the sound of his voice. And it doesn't matter, you know, who who you are, where you're from, the color of your skin, how much money's in your bank account you could be weary and burdened too. It's not just a particular group. It's not just rich. It's not just poor. Anybody who fits that description of weary and burdened, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick of not having peace with God. I'm sick of um, not having a clean, a, a clear conscience in life. I'm, 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 I'm just sick of, of sin and, and not being able to change and, and, and knowing what I'm doing is wrong, but, but really seeing no, no way to do otherwise. Uh, it doesn't, all kinds of people, all kinds of walks of life can meet that prerequisite of, of being weary and, and burdened. And, and again, the wider context informs us because he talks about how the father doesn't reveal himself to the wise and learned, but he reveals, he reveals his, the things of God to little children. And this is what the father is pleased to do. So he'll call the simple He'll call what the world deems foolish. He'll call the weak. He'll call the weary. He'll call the burden. He'll call the poor. And um, it's not that he wouldn't call the rich and the intelligent and the wise and all that, but often those people just don't have ears to hear him. Even religious folk uh, don't often have ears to hear him. That's why elsewhere Jesus said to the Pharisees that the tax collectors and the, and the prostitutes, they're getting into the kingdom ahead of you. And it's not that those it's it's not that god is accepting of those types of sin of course but it's that they are acknowledging their sin they recognize their sin it's it's probably more obvious and they're willing and ready to repent and so this wonderful invitation come to me all you are weary and burdened i will give you rest for your souls isn't that just a wonderful these are such wonderful encouraging words often when i go out evangelizing and street preaching that is my call to people that is my call to everyone within the sound of my voice, because I am a firm believer that Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. I truly believe that. And we live in a generation where people are so traumatized and, and scarred and anxious and depressed and broken um, by so many experiences and so many things that are instilled in them that by the time they come to a preacher like me, they're probably taking medication. They're probably um, 
uh, pill coping and, and, or, or booze coping, self-medicating. They're probably seeing a therapist. They're probably reading books and, and, and looking into various resources, uh, for, for self-help and this, that, and the other, uh, there's, there's something, and to that point, there's something my, my pastor often says when, when I would street preach with him, uh, you know, he would say, Hey, you want to talk about Jesus? And the person would say back, no, I'm good. He says, you're good. Is that what you tell your therapist? Come on, somebody gets real. It gets real. And uh, uh, because a lot of people do, we are living in times where folks are desperately seeking rest for their souls. And they're going to look for it in, in all these different avenues. They're going to look for all these ways to, to just feel good about themselves, to have peace with themselves. And they'll pay money for it, by the way, all the stuff that I mentioned, the medication, the therapies and all these things that costs money. And Jesus laid his life down. Jesus offers rest for our souls and he offers it for free of charge. So I love that invitation. I love that verse. I love it as an evangelistic invitation as well, because anybody who meets that prerequisite can come to Jesus. And he says here something interesting. He says, take my yoke upon you. Now, a yoke is a metaphorical expression. Um, uh, typically, we're talking about a, a piece of wood that would be hitched to the neck of an oxen so that it could pull a, a cart or a plow or something and do work for its master. And the the, the metaphorical meaning of it is that an, an individual who wants to become a disciple of a certain rabbi or of a certain school of rabbinic thought or, or a, of an interpretation of God's law or a religious sect would yoke themselves to that rabbi as their master and follow his teachings, commit to follow that interpretation in that, in that way of life. And he's, he's basically saying, by when he says, take my yoke, He's saying, take off those other yokes and take my yoke upon you. They're, my yoke is easy. My burden is, is light. And, and he is, I think, low-key rebuking the Pharisees and the scribes. Later on in uh, Matthew 25, he says to them that you tie heavy burdens to men's backs, but you, you don't lift a, a finger to help them. In other words, you your interpretation of the law has so many added requirements and traditions, and you tell people they have to do A through Z, and, and when they can't do it, you don't give them grace, you don't give them a leg up, you don't, you don't assist them or forgive them or show mercy to them, and so... And so instead of it helping them be closer to God, it it will either make them just a, a miserable religious hypocrite like they are, a, two, a twofold son of hell, or just somebody who's very distressed and in despair. I think of uh, Martin Luther uh, before he, he became the the great Protestant reformer. When he was a Catholic monk, he because he had yoked himself to, to Catholic teachings, uh, and they don't believe in justification by faith. It's all works. He had to he had to go to confession hours and hours and hours at a time, confessing every little sin that he could possibly think of that he may have committed to to the priest. And he would he would live a very ascetic uh, lifestyle to to basically punish himself and to deny himself so that he could somehow work off his his sins and make himself pleasing to God what a miserable life what a horrible life that he you, you would live ridden by guilt worrying that even though I'm doing all these things and I'm trying my best I might still go to hell I might still go to hell I was talking to a muslim gentleman just last night and I I I, I said the words inshallah inshallah what do those mean to you and he says if god wills if god wills and I said, I said to him, will you go to heaven when you die? He says, inshallah, if God wills. And when a Muslim says that, they're basically saying, I don't know. And I just hope that my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. That whole idea of the scale of the good deeds outweighing the bad deeds, that comes from Islam, of course. And, and it's a works-based religion, just like every other religion is. And, and it's, it's, it's amazing because it contradicts what Muslims will say. Allah is merciful. Allah is merciful. Allah is merciful. No, he's not. Because if at the end of the day, it depends on you doing more good deeds than bad deeds. Um, and, and if you do bad deeds, you're going to go to hell. Even if you tried your best, then Allah is not very merciful. And mind you, this gentleman I talking to was in the 
process of getting drunk, having a night on the town when that's not, that's not good. You know, if you're a Muslim or a Christian for that matter, that's not a good thing. And so he already knows he's inconsistent. He knows, so he, but, but he's yoked to this. He's yoked to a slavish devotion to a, a system of teaching, a religious system that that will not justify him that will not give him peace but he's always going to be working 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 on sort of the hamster wheel or the treadmill if you will always moving 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 but never really making uh progress and never really having that blessed assurance that the true believer in jesus has so so that's how a lot of of course the religious jews of that time were they had you on the the hamster wheel of religious works. It was a works-based religion that did not offer assurance or peace with God. It simply couldn't. Um, and, and every religion is like that. And sometimes we in the Christian world, and sometimes we as pastors, I'm talking to those who are uh, training for the ministry, of course, those who are uh, pursuing the call of the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, um, that that can even be in your circle that you can yoke yourself to certain uh, ideologies, to certain uh, teachings uh, of 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 men that are not of God, but you will believe it that it is of God, and you will devote yourself to it, and it will let you down, and it will burn you out, and that's sort of where I, I kind of want to get into a, a a topic that I think is prevalent in our culture: the crushing yoke of men. Uh, that that is upon our culture, and it is our fixation on mental health and wellness. I know this is just a total, total 180 from where we were just a moment ago, but but I think this is a crushing yoke on on many people, and pastors are not excluded from that. Our culture's present fixation on mental health and wellness has had the opposite effect in that it has created the most mental unwellness of of any generation that's that's my theory uh here that uh we embrace uh be, because we're we're so fixated on it now we think of everything in psychological categories and we psychoanalyze and we self-diagnose everything about ourselves um to our personality quirks, even character flaws. You know, you, you got the, the millennial Gen Z generation, they hyperventilate, oh, I can't make a phone call. Uh, you, I mean, you literally know people like that. They they get so like a nervous breakdown if they have to make a phone call or if they, ha they have to do something like that. And they they chalk it up to some sort of psychological ailment, right? But we, we, but we do that with everything. It could be our per personality quirks. It could be character flaws. You could be an antisocial, weird, rude person. And we got a, we got a psychological category for that. And we, we're going to accommodate you. And you, you can still be that and identify as that even. You can even wear it as a badge of honor. Even sinful proclivities and, and addictions and, and desire for sin. Of course, homosexuality and uh, transgenderism is is you know at the, kind of at the top of that list, but but all kinds of things like we began calling alcoholism a disease and and addiction to drugs a disease and 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 all these things right and and so everything now becomes psychoanalyzed and and we're we're all traumatized we're all depressed we're all anxious, um, and and you see this uh, again among Christians and among pastors, and I think this is an ungodly yoke, and it does come across in a lot of our current big Eva uh, thought leaders, our speakers, our authors, who embrace sort of the mental unwellness uh, fixation, and they try to baptize it in Christian uh, language. And so what I want to do there is kind of give you a realistic portrait, because there is sorrow in the Christian life, and there is suffering in the Christian life. But we must distinguish the sorrow and suffering that God wills for us and the suffer, sorrow and suffering that we inflict on ourselves because we embrace bad teaching, because we embrace a whole wrong-headed approach uh, to, these, uh, to these topics. So we have pastors who are, uh, again, you know, basically being very transparent. I'm not okay. I'm struggling. Anxiety, depression, despair 
trauma, trauma, burnout, suicide. Okay. Suicide we had in uh, late 2019. Uh, Pastor Jared Wilson, who is doing Harvest Crusades with Greg Laurie, just took a, a, a position at that church there in California, I think, and uh, had, you know, wife and beautiful boys, I think two boys, and he killed himself uh, late 2019. And I was looking at his Instagram earlier and, and just kind of refreshing myself on this because I, I had done a lot of reflecting on that issue. Um, as it relates to him and to to others, to the Robin Williamses of the world, and and, and you know people like that that we sort of lionize uh, even pa past their death, though they took their lives, though they committed a grave sin and self murder. But I'm looking at all the stuff, and and he's he's talking this language of basically owning it. I'm an anxious, depressed despairing traumatic person and he's acknowledging hey jesus just sometimes he just doesn't fix this and and it's okay to be not okay and and all this stuff and sometimes you're just going to need therapy and sometimes you're just going to need this and and, and and again i see it as the yoke i see it as the crushing yoke that you become now on um on this on this hamster wheel or this treadmill of works now of various psychologically uh, derived co uh, coping mechanisms of the world to try to maintain, to try to just keep a smile on your face, to try to keep performing. And but what did it do for him? And what does it do for so many? It doesn't. It doesn't stop these things. I think it accelerates these things. Now I'm going to share some statistics that have been floating around for uh, quite a while. They were first published in a, a, a research by uh, George Barna, the Barna Group, in uh, 2012. And you may have heard these things before, but I'm just going to repeat some of them. Uh, ministry dropout. This was this was 2012. I can only imagine what it's like now. Uh, but back then, uh, an average of 1,500 ministers drop out of ministry a month in the U.S. Right? We're so burnt out. We're so we're so um, traumatized by our work as ministers that we we have to leave the ministry. And of course, there can be there could be various reasons for that. But but look look here. The next statistic is longevity. Only 10% of ministers will make it to age 65, which means 90% of ministers will quit before they reach 65. 50% of ministers don't even make it five years in the ministry. We see that 70% of pastors battle with depression. Battle with depression. I, I mentioned one pastor, the late Jared Wilson. Uh, John Gray is another one. He's still with us and He's in the land of the living, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful he has an opportunity, but he's got some things he has to get right. He's had a lot of sinful indiscretions the past couple of years, and I'm putting that mildly. Things that bring reproach to his character, things that honestly disqualify him from ministry. And when he gets up in front of his church to confess these things, he's talking about his childhood insecurities. And, you know, he had an emotional affair with a woman and that woman played on his emotional insecurities and, oh, how hard it is to be a pastor. And now he has no one to talk to and all these things. And the congregation is just clapping it up and, and applauding him. And and if if I am to think the best of John Gray, I still think he's disqualified. If I'm to just kind of, you know, I'm going to bite my tongue. I'm not going to call him a charlatan. I'm not going to call him a pimpin pastor, okay? But I'm I'm going to say that e even with all these mental health things that he's confessing because he did he had another video not that long ago. He went on Instagram 30 minutes talking about his just how messed up he is mentally and emotionally. You're not fit for the ministry. Let's put all that other stuff aside. You're struggling to that degree with your mental health. You are not a First Timothy three leader. I'm sorry. You know, temperance is mentioned in First Timothy three as as a qualification for a, an elder or a deacon. And temperance is about mastery of your emotions, mastering yourself. You have to have soundness of mind. You have to have sobriety. This is a man who lacks sound mind. He does not have peace of mind. He doesn't live with that. And he has to then yoke himself to all these, you know, all these psychiatric uh, uh, teachings and, and, and precepts. He's no better than the people he's trying to help. He's not qualified. I'm sorry. 
So you have 70% of pastors that battle with depression. Likewise, 70% of pastors state they don't have a close friend to confide in with their struggles. 50% of ministers today would leave ministry today if uh, they could be living, if they could make a living outside the church. And so in other words, they just feel trapped. They're doing something they don't want to do or don't feel uh, uh, like, they, like they're equipped to do. And they're doing it because they ain't got nothing else, right? They can't take their Bible studies degree um, and, and go into this or that industry with it, you know? So they're stuck. 80% of pastors' wives wish their husbands chose a different job. 90% of pastors' families feel the negative pressure of being in the ministry. Uh, wow. Oh, so, so, so then it has this reverberation to the families. And you often hear those testimonies. And I'm not saying it's all the time, and I'm not saying it's as widespread as some people might make it out to be, but you do hear of the the PKs and the MKs, the, the you know, the pastor and the missionary kids who are who who feel their upbringing was 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 substandard. It was messed up, right? Because their dad or their mom was putting on a show and performing and having to do this despite just being tore up from the floor up, needing to check up from the neck up. And so the house was not in order. Um, let's let's go on. Pa low self-esteem. 70% of pastors say they have lower self-esteem since being in the ministry than when they first started. Low self-esteem. Now, that's just an amazing thing to, to struggle with as a Christian, as a Christian as a new creation, as someone who is the righteousness of God in Christ. I'll I'll talk more about that in a moment. We have church attendance down. 3,500 people stop going to church a day in the U.S. Church in the, attendance in the U.S. over the years has been steadily declining uh, from 20.4% in 1990 to 18.7% in 2000 to 17.7% .7 in 2004. And, and so you see that, that decline in can only imagine how that is has accelerated uh, since 2012. Losing cultural ground, only 6% of churches report each year in the U.S. Uh, 90 report growth each year in the U.S. 94% are either maintaining or losing ground. However, the U.S. population grows around 1% a year. Thus, the people of God are losing a, a ground in both society and the church. As a result, the body of Christ is running roughly 10,000 churches behind every four years to meet the current population needs. And then and then lastly, um, this is a little more recent. Uh, this is more research from Barna. This is from November of 2021, uh, post-COVID and post-BLM Summer of Love. Uh, we see 38% of pastors considered quitting full-time ministry in that year uh, from, from the start of COVID and BLM to, to the time this research was done. Um, and that was 46% under age 45 and then 34% over age 45. Did I say that right? 30, 46% under age 45 and 34% over age 45. So you are seeing the younger uh, people, maybe they entered Bible college, they just got their degree, and now they can't go to church. Church is closed, and they're just getting rocked by this, and they're getting rocked by the social justice movement and and, and Black Lives Matter and all these things, that which is Marxism. Um, but, but it's causing waves, and it's causing division in their churches. They don't know what to do about that. And then the, the the research also shows that only 35% of, of pastors are considered, quote, healthy in terms of relational, emotional, physical, spiritual, vocational, and financial well-being. Only 35%, only about a third. So that's 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 the stuff you hear often. And, and when you hear those statistics, it's always pray for your pastors. And it almost becomes sort of the sob story about, you know, just how hard it is to be a pastor. Let's play, let's play a violin for pastor. Let's play a sad song and a dirge for pastor because it's it's just such a hard life. And, and I can't help but think that's kind of part of the devil's lie um, that makes pastors so depressed. 
I love pastoring. I love serving the Lord. I love serving his people. You take the suffering, you take the success, you put it all together. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I don't know about you, but I'm I'm too proud to dig, to beg and I can't dig holes, okay? I'm too proud to, to beg and I can't dig holes. So it, it really is ministry or or nothing for me. Uh, I, I did other kinds of work. I, I did I did secular work at various places. And the whole time I was screaming, let me just preach the gospel. Like I, that's what I get to do, guys. I get to love Jesus with my friends. It's the, it's the best life ever. And in, and yes, I do acknowledge the suffering and we'll get to that a little bit later. We acknowledge the suffering. We acknowledge the sacrifice. We acknowledge the heartbreak. We acknowledge what it means to die a thousand deaths. And yet I don't identify with depression. I don't identify with feeling isolated and discouraged and low self-esteem or or the or the unhappy family that wishes I did something else. I I'm sorry I don't and I don't want to say that I'm better than anybody, but I I do think that there, I have come under a different yoke than what many pastors are that what you're learning in seminaries and what you're reading in books and what you're hearing in conferences um where this again this mental unwellness fixation is being baptized in Christian terms, and we're accepting it now and taking it upon ourselves as though it's God's will for us, and it's not. And so, and so, th this is very problematic. This yoke of mental unwellness, uh, for a few reasons: the lifelong need of therapy, medication, and various other psychiatric coping mechanisms becomes prevalent as we diagnose every personal quirk, character flaw, and even sinful proclivity as a psychological ailment that we must bear as our cross as long as we live. And again, we wear it as a badge of honor that I'm this way. I'm antisocial. I'm easily butthurt. I mean, offended. I mean, traumatized. I, you know, we, we, we wear these things as a badge of honor. I'm, I, I'm not okay, but that's okay. And, and Jesus won't heal me um, of this, but I'll be healed in the world to come and stuff like that. We just accept it, that this is just the way things are and there's no change. And, and, and I see three main issues. Uh, number one, it renders God's children as mere victims, not overcomers of their personal struggles. You become a victim of things that honestly can boil down to behaviors. It can boil down to behaviors. So, for example, suicide doesn't just happen to a person, right? We're talking about, you know, we mentioned Pastor Jared Wilson, Robin Williams, other famous people who committed suicide. And we want to remove the element of moral culpability from the equation when we talk about it we don't we, we just we want to kind of gloss over that and if we the, the fact that they actually killed themselves they murdered themselves they ended their life it is, it is a wicked thing on many levels but we act like it just happened to them or th their mental health issues just overtook them removing responsibility removing the freedom of choice and and it's not only with suicide but with so many things we act like you know, with addictions, I mentioned drinking, alcohol, and 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 various drugs. Like, there's no, there's no element of personal responsibility. There's no element of free will to that. We're just victims. These things happen to us, and I think that's that's a devil's lie. God will hold you responsible for what you do. You're not going to stand before the judgment seat and say, "Well, I had this, this, and that condition in my psych." psychiatrist and my therapist got together and diagnosed me with this, this, and this, and that's why I was the way I was. You can't say that at the judgment seat. You will be responsible for, for certain choices you have made. The second is that it insults God's spirit who gives us new hearts and makes us a new creation. If the, if the Christian, if the pastor of John Gray, um, no less, or somebody like that, um, stands before struggling with these things, it's like, where's the room for, um, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Behold, the old is gone and the new is here. Where's the room to say that? Now, I don't think someone like John Gray would ever deny that. They would say, of course, I believe in that, but this is my experience. And so your experience and your feelings uh, begins to trump God's word and says, well, basically, these things are are maybe they're true for some, but they're not true for me. And and but they they nullify the word of God. They nullify the power 
of the Holy Spirit to really set us free from these things. And I'm not saying that a Christian can't struggle with that, but when you normalize it, it's not, it's okay to not be okay. We're always going to struggle with this until the resurrection. I mean, how much of you is new at that point? I, I'm a believer that so much of, of what we call anxiety and depression, okay, this might be a hot take, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm prepared to defend it. Um, and, and you can email me, well, you can email uh, Lauren Sciansky, our VP of Admissions and Student Relations. You can email Lauren and and take it up with her about my hot take here is that so much depression and anxiety comes from um, personal choices and it comes from uh, patterns of living. So I'll take my own life as an example and, and, and results are not typical, but when I was a youngster, I uh, took antidepressants. I was prescribed them. I took Paxil, I took Depakote. Um, when I was like 13, 14, I thought I was, um, I thought I was mentally ill. I was um, psychotic or something. I, I I thought that, but it wasn't really the case. It and and it would be an insult actually to somebody who actually suffers with things that that can really be considered that to be considered psychotic, to be considered um, manic depressive or something like that. It would be insulting to them to say that what I was was those things because really I was just listening to too much depressing music. If I'm being honest, I was listening to depressing music. I was, I was living a depressed life and therefore I had a depressed state of mind. I, I was taught that was the yoke, so to speak, that was upon me in my, in my upbringing. Those are the influences that I chose to allow to speak into my life, to shape my character, to how I react, to how I see the world. And I saw it in a very depressed way to how I see myself, to see myself very low. I learned that those were learned behaviors. Those were learned responses. Okay. I don't take those medications anymore. And, and by God's grace, when I became a Christian at age 20 and I started to get discipled, I still battled with feeling depressed, feeling mopey, not loving myself the way God wants me to love myself. But it was through discipleship that I learned not to live a depressing life that produces depression. Okay. Um, and, and, and by the power of God's spirit and through the means of discipleship, which Jesus wants us all to, to participate in. And then, and then lastly, it creates lifelong dependency on various coping mechanisms that fail to deliver the life-changing power that Jesus freely offers. It creates lifelong dependency on psychiatric coping mechanisms. You're going to see a therapist to the day you die. You're going to take this pill to the day you die. You're going to, um, you know, have to buy these books and make all these efforts and and stumble and fall and trial and error and be on the treadmill of 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 basically a works system where you're seeking peace, you're seeking validation, you're seeking fulfillment, um, you're seeking acceptance, and and truly the the riches and wisdom of God and all these things is in Christ, and the, and you are complete in Him. Um, and, and so Jesus says, come to me, all, you all who are weary and, and burdened, I will give you rest for your souls. And you say, that's a great offer, Jesus, but I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to my therapist. I'm going to go to Dr. Steinowitz and sit on their couch for $200 an hour. And we're going to talk about my childhood and probe around and I'm going to get to know myself better, right? We're, we're basically going to do that. And, and again, like a Jared Wilson, like so many of these people, you embrace this. And what does it do for you? You can still drop out of ministry. You can still apostatize. You can still fall into sin, adultery, and addiction. You can you can still join a cult. I mean, it, it can manifest in different ways, I suppose. So, so I want to talk about the yokes of men and the burdens of God. The yokes of men are the expectations, requirements, philosophies, limitations, and methods that others place on us or we on ourselves but are not of God. These create unnecessary hardship and strife, which contribute to anxiety, depression, and overall burnout and spiritual shipwreck among ministers. So, so these are, these are again, expectations, requirements, philosophies, limitations, and methods that others place on us. So it can be, it can be coming from the people you're listening to. Okay. That's why we broke away from the, 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 the seminarian industrial complex, 
because I think a lot of that thinking is is there too. And and you you see a lot of pastors are coming out of, of seminary with that way of thinking. So it could come from the people you're listening to, from your seminary, from the conferences, to the podcast, to the books, to your to to whomever, or 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 from you yourself, but it's not of God. You treat it like it is of God. You treat it like it's gospel. You don't question these these idioms and these maxims and these practices um, and, and these precepts that are coming. You Again, they're usually de de derived from modern secular psychiatry. And I'm not saying there's no value to that. But we treat it as though it's equal to God or it's equal to his word or it's equal to his ways. And it's not. These create unnecessary hardship and strife. They become burdens to us. Instead of making things better, they make things worse. Instead of bringing us closer to God, it makes us, it alienates us from God. This is what I believe is contributing to so much burnout. Here are some examples, and this is not at all an exhaustive list, but here are some examples that I've identified. Number one is baptized self-pity. Baptized self-pity. Again, this is a mentality among pastors that it's so hard it's so hard to be a pastor. Look, if it's so hard to be a pastor, then you could go work at a brick kiln in Pakistan like many of our Christians and brothers and sisters do. I would rather do what I do in Dallas, Texas. Listen, I'm thankful to God and, and for, for his blessing on my life. I would rather do this. I'd rather love Jesus and and, and preach the gospel with my friends Um. And if you don't see ministry like that, man, I don't know how you see it. But I would rather do that than work in a brick kiln. Like there's a thousand and one things that I would rather not do. This is like the best possible thing I could be doing. And yet the blogs and the podcasts and all these things, like the pastor needs to lament. The pastor needs to grieve. The pastor needs a sympathetical. The pastor's so broken. The pastor has so many struggles. And, and they treat it like it's the worst thing in the world. And I think there's some people who kind of see around that but they're they're sneaky because because I, I again there's struggle there's sacrifice I'll get to that but they're, the 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 sneaky thing is they they know it's not as hard as people make it out to be i think there's some people who cho choose ministry because they can get a cushy white collar job and like i said i'll confess myself i can't dig holes and i'm too proud to beg okay look at these hands Look at these hands. Do they look like they can change an oil filter? Do they look like they could change a spare tire? Okay. I'm I'm sorry. I'm a I'm a city slicker and I, I just I just wasn't raised doing that kind of stuff. Like this is this is all I got. And there's gonna be a lot of people who are kind of in a similar boat, like, um, you know, I'm not good at a lot of stuff, but I know how to brown nose, I know how to manage, I know how to, I know how to, you know, kind of have basic level of people skills, maybe I could do this. Or maybe they follow their celebrity leaders and they think, man, maybe I can be like this guy and that guy, whatever, right? So, but, but, but like I said, but then you can, then you can have it and have all these things. And like I sit in an air conditioned building every day, uh, every day to work in my office. I have my own office. You know how many people just don't have all these things? I, you, you have the time off thing. It's just, come on now. I don't want to say it's because I'm pastor and I'm doing other work. I'm doing another job besides that. So I'm bivocational right now. Um, so, but I don't want to like, okay, I'm, I'm being transparent and I'm thinking out loud here, but you, you, you got to understand that pastors in some ways have it easy in some ways you, you, it's especially in the United States of America, for the most part, you're sitting in an air conditioned building. For the most part, you, you a lot of pastors have their own office. For the most part, pastors get a lot more days off than a lot of people. Okay, they do, they do, and and you know there's a lot of perks, there's a lot of benefits. You get you can t you, you you can get uh, your lunches, your your church and ministry lunches on the on the church card and all that stuff, and and it's on the church budget or the ministry budget. You get to do that stuff. You get to speak and and have adoration of people and have people think so well of you. There's a lot of perks. There's a lot of benefits to um to 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 it as it currently exists. I think there's a lot of people who recognize that and they go for those reasons. Okay. 
So, so that's another spicy take. And again, you can reach out to, uh, uh, to Lauren about that if, if you disagree with me. Um, but, but then you can hide behind this baptized self-pity. You have so much ease and comfort compared to most people, even people in your congregation who are working hard day after day with their hands to pay the tithes that pay your, um, your living, help pay your living. And then you get to shield yourself behind this language. Oh, it's so hard, so hard to be a pastor. Come on, I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. I'm not keeping it 100. I'm keeping it 1,000 here. Keeping it 1,000. Let me talk about some some other things here. This again, this is not exhaustive. Other yokes that really uh, contribute to this the burnout factor um, among pastors: man fearing and man pleasing. I've noticed that since 2020 with COVID, with uh, BLM and all that stuff, especially um, a lot of the thought leaders are basically teaching us how to have a measured tone and how to somehow play a peacemaker between two parties. So the pro-vax and the anti-vax, the pro-BLM and the pro um, not Marxism crowd, right? Who, who are just not for, you know, BLM. Um, we're trying to keep these, these two parties at odds we're trying to keep the uh, these two groups happy together and help them get along and e even more recently you had the dobbs decision that overturned roe v wade what were a lot of our thought leaders saying in their blogs and their in their in their in their uh, sermons and things like that they're trying to tell us well don't celebrate too loudly if you thought this was a good thing because there's people who are grieving right now and what they're trying to do is they're trying to man fear and man please okay so you can you can basically be compromised you can have people in your church that believe in sinful things like abortion that support the marxist agenda of black lives matter that are for uh forced vaccination and lockdown and all those things they're for things of that nature and 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 the, but but what we're trying to do is get all these people who disagree. Let's just get along. This is called man fearing and man pleasing. Okay, that's what a politician does. They're trying to get people on both sides. Let's just get it all in together. But there are things where you just got to take a stand and let let the chips fall where they may. Some people will leave. One group may leave over one issue. Another group may leave over another issue. When I was doing research on pastors uh, leaving the ministry, I was learning about. I was reading the Washington Post, which is uber liberal, of course, and you know their slant is is always going to be in that direction, in the leftward direction, and and a couple of the the pastors they they mentioned specifically talked about leaving the churches because they they're about white colonialism and and they don't care about social justice and they don't care about the vaccine and, and loving your neighbor. And I'm like, good riddance, get rid of those people. I'm not trying to keep those people happy in my church. I'm not trying to keep them comfortable in my church. I'm going to have a stance on this and let the chips fall where they may. But but that's a great case in point. But this was before 2020. We're trying to keep people happy. We're trying to keep the tithers happy. We're trying to keep attendance up. We're trying to keep the church full and, and juggle all these interests. And sometimes you'll have factions within your churches, different groups of people. You're trying to make that person... And and that can just be wearisome. You trying to if you fear man, that, that's always going to lead to burnout. The fear of man is a snare, of course. Okay, so we can't do that. The next thing is following ministry fads. Following ministry fads, and this too will lead to burnout. Um, another example of this is the church growth movement. Okay, and what the church growth movement is all about is is licking your finger and sticking it up in the air to see which way the wind is blowing and then you're going to move your church that way that's what it's all about that's the, that's what the church growth movement has been about since the 80s since bill hybels and all that what's research your demographics the type of people you want to attract to your churches what are they like and all that stuff how do we get the family crowd how do we get the upper middle class how do we get the young people the young adults how do we get the youth so we're going to make everything uh, cater to to those things to cater to these various crowds and you make these things an idol see we follow these things so blindly and we think it's of god but it's not people say well i'm going to change my music style to accommodate young people 
or I'm going to change my music style so that I can be more ethnically diverse and, and, and things of that nature. And then you're going to be changing it again and again to, to please this person and to please that person. And, and, and then a lot of those people became woke. They became woke because they're, again, they're all about following the way that the wind blows. And when the wind blows woke, all of those leaders that you followed all those years, suddenly they're saying really crazy out there stuff. But if they're actually consistent with what they've always been. And they've always been man fearers. They've always been man pleasers. They've always been fad followers. And now they're following the current fad and they're seeking to please the wicked world. Trying to do that, trying to please fickle human beings, trying to follow the trends of, of this wicked culture uh, is tremendous uh, 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 burnout. Now, we have then next is uh, unrealistic expectations of ministry success. Uh, this is where you meet, you, you hear about Pastor Rockstar, the conference speaker. He, he had 30 people when he started and then in five years he's got 10,000 and you read his book and you read his success story. Oftentimes when you read those success stories, it's, it's often not super practical. And if it's not, and if it's, even if it is practical, it's really not that profound. It's not stuff you don't already know. But it's more about how awesome Pastor Rockstar is and, and, and what they've accomplished, right? So I could go on and on with this, but there are many, many yokes, many crushing yokes and things that contribute to burnout. Um, to mention a few quickly, lack of order in your life, lack of order in your home can um, can lead to, to this as well. Uh, and uh, greed and coveting, seeing the gospel as a means of worldly gain is is as well because as first timothy 6 talks about those who go after wealth uh pierce themselves with many griefs you bring trouble on yourself when you begin to allow money to dictate the direction of your ministry disobedience and sin especially hidden sin uh will always contribute to those feelings of anxiety depression despair burnout and then lacking devotional life putting on a performance publicly but having no connection to God privately. And of course, that's huge. And that's a whole message in and of itself. Now, in contrast to uh, the burdens of, of man, I want to talk about the burdens of God. The burdens of God. And these are the hardships and suffering that God promised, even as he promised to sustain us by his amazing grace. Are you Are you hearing that? There is hardship and suffering that God promises that it's it's God's will for your life to to experience these things. It's true. And this is where I want to get realistic. I'm not saying it's just all rah rah shish kumba and and I never have a I never have a rainy day here because of Jesus. Uh there's there's hardship, there's suffering, there's sacrifice. And these there's things that that are necessary. But you have that along with great joy and, and God's sustaining power. As the great missionary to Africa, David Livingston said, he said his prayer was, God, send me anywhere, only go with me, lay any burden on me, only sustain me, and sever any tie in my heart except the tie that binds my heart to yours. And it's true that if God lays a burden on you, he will sustain you to carry that burden. God will not ask you to do anything that his grace will not empower you to do. Here are some examples of the burdens of God, things that God can will for his servants and his children. Persecution. This hardly needs qualification, right? The Lord himself crucified, rejected by this world. The apostles uh, uh, martyred and, and mistreated. Uh, this goes without saying that anyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Hard work. God wants you to work hard. God wants you not only to work hard in the ministry and to really be that, that worker who's worthy of your keep, sometimes that will call for bivocational. And you're not just going to you know, expect that you're going to get a salary and and, benef and benefits to have this cushy white collar job where you work one day a week and you golf the other six days um, between having um, 
between having expensive lunches on the church's budget. Come on. Hard work. God wants you to work hard for him. And, and it can be long days and it can be blood, sweat, and tears. Personal sacrifice and self-denial in service of the calling. The old saying goes, others can, you can't. There's things that other people will do because they're not Christians. They're sinners. They don't have any restraint. They don't have any code they follow so they can sin and feel great about it. Of course, you can't. But even as a consecrated servant of the Lord, there's just things that you can't do because, and it can be very personal. Um, but but God would constrain you to to live a certain way, to live a certain lifestyle, to to relocate your family to a certain place, because this is what He wants you to do. Some of the most obvious examples are those missionaries who go to foreign mission fields. They do so to unfamiliar places, places that are often you know very poverty stricken. They're they're unfamiliar. They're unfamiliar with the language. All those things. And they would do so in service of the calling. Right now we have uh, the Nicole family, Tisa and Jean, and, and their daughters uh, going to the Philippines. And there's going to be uh, things that they deny themselves, pleasures and conveniences and a life of ease that they would de they, they deny themselves when they go to, to live and, and minister in the Philippines. There is betrayal and desertion. It does come with the territory, of course, uh, in the ministry that people will betray and desert you just like they betrayed and deserted our Lord Jesus Christ. There is grief at sin, sickness, and sorrow in the world. The, the, you would see things in the world that grieve you and you, and you will weep and you will feel, and maybe other people won't feel, maybe even other Christians won't feel what you feel because you're, you're getting God's heart for a lost and dying world. You're feeling indignation when the things of God are blasphemed, you're longing for God's kingdom to come. The, and these things can burden you. These things can weigh on your mind and on your heart. You can have concern for God's people, others in Christ. Uh, of course, when you're thinking about people you know that are going through things and that troubles you, that troubles your heart. It weighs on you. and that, But that is a weight that God wills for you to bear uh, on behalf of your friends to help them bear their burdens battling sin and temptation you do have the flesh and the spirit right and you will you know at times th those battles may be tougher they may be tougher the temptation may be stronger and then of course every personal trial everything that happens to us is father filtered so whether you have health woes financial woes family woes etc it's just it happens to all of us of course these things you will still experience as a, as a minister. Um, but even as you experience these things, you can experience them with great joy. As William Barclay, and I don't, rec I don't recommend William Barclay because he was a liberal, I'll just say that, but I, I do like this quote, and this quote has gotten around over the years. He said in his uh, commentary on Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus promised his disciples three things that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. Now you take those last two things, absurdly happy and in constant trouble. How can you be both at the same time? We think that is a contradiction in terms, but uh, the, the, the word of God does show us that again and again, that though there is trouble, though there is tribulation, though there is persecution, though there is rejection, there is joy, there is peace. Amen. Uh, John 16, 33 Jesus says to his disciples, I have told you these things so that you may have peace, shalom. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Second Timothy 1.12, Paul nearing the end of his life, awaiting execution in a Roman prison says, that is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. He says, I'm suffering, but it's no cause for shame. He's not having a, a pity party. He's not questioning his life choices or filled with regret as though he did something wrong. Why? Because he knows him who he has believed. Later on in the letter, 2 Timothy 4, 14 through 18, Paul re relives recall some of his hardships he says alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm the lord will repay him for what he has done 
you should be on your guard too against him because he strongly opposed our message. At our first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone has deserted me. And he's talking about his, his appeal before Caesar. The first time he appealed to Caesar, he appeared before the wicked emperor Nero, gave his first defense, carrying going to those to the, the events all the way back in Jerusalem when uh, they they dragged him out of the temple and were, re were ready to kill him. And he, he appealed. It, it, that appeal brought him all the way to Rome, and he, he's now answering those charges. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Everyone deserted him, but who was with him? The Lord is with him. The Lord stood at my side. The Lord gave me strength. And lastly, I think this list uh, of, of burdens that I went through can probably be summarized in what I'm about to read, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. And it says here, are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Beside everything else, I feel pressure daily, my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin, and I do not inwardly burn? Think about that. He mentions all these external things. I mean, it would be obvious that to, to, to suffer poverty and persecution the way he has, of course, that would be a cause for uh, distress. But he also mentions his 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 heart for the churches. He also mentions his his inner struggle to to fight the good fight and 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 stay free from sin and to be a holy man. Um. So so he deals with that too, and he goes on. He says, "If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I'm not lying." In Damascus, the governor under Aretas had the city of Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered from a basket in a wall in order to slip through his hands. He goes on in chapter 12, and this is where we'll start to bring it to a close. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. See, Paul is not is not glossing over these things. He has a realistic view. I've had it. I've had hardship, physical ailments and, and all these things, I, I, but I boast about it. I don't cry about it. I boast about it. Even if I should choose to boast, I would be no fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so that no one will think more than what is warranted. Uh, think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being coming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power 
may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. See, these things are meant to humble us. Just like Paul, we don't know what the messenger of the thorn in the flesh was, this agent of Satan. Was it a spiritual attack? Was it a physical ailment? Was it, was it, was it temptation? We don't know. Uh, we're not going to go beyond the scriptures. But he boasts in general weakness, insults, hardship, persecution, difficulties. For Christ's sake, these things were to humble him. These things were to keep him grounded. These things were so that he would turn his eyes up at the Lord and see his need for the Lord and not be a puffed up, arrogant man, but be somebody who lives wholly dependent on the grace and strength of God. That's why he says in the midst of our weakness, my grace is made perfect. My power is made perfect in your weakness. My grace is enough for you. You can withstand anything. And Christian friend, yeah, you, you're going to have hard times. I, I really had to carefully qualify it when I said being a pastor is an easy job. I mean that on a few levels. I mean it because if you're called, God's going to give you the grace then no matter what you do, man, you're going to you're gonna love it. You're going to have the time of your life and you're not going to want to do anything else. And then I had to qualify it the other way because for a lot of us, especially in the U.S., it could be pretty cushy. It could be pretty cushy. You could get out of Bible college, go on Indeed, get a job somewhere and just have this white collar job, get more days off than most people, have your own office space, all this stuff, and 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 then and then complain about how hard it is. Come on. I had, to, I had to qualify it. But look, there's there's hardship. If you're doing if if you're if you are experiencing rejection, that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. If you're experiencing heartache, you're not you're not doing it wrong. If you're experiencing opposition, you're not doing that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. And 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 you can have another greater opportunity to experience God's grace in your life. OK, now to finally close, I'm going to make this practical. Here's here's five things, five things we could have. Number one, gratitude. Bible says that when you pray with thanksgiving, that the God of peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Then contentment, be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you nor forsake you. And once again, as the psalmist said, God is my helper. What can man do to me? Third, have an eternal perspective. Know that the things of this life are light and momentary in comparison to the eternal weight of glory that will be revealed to us. Four, have a robust devotional life. Um, Stay close to Jesus. I think that's where so many pastors fail is that they lack that one thing, being in the prayer closet, being in God's presence. And then um, lastly, do the Lord's work. Do the Lord's work. Um, if I could add a sixth thing, if you're married especially, make your spouse and your home a refuge and an oasis. Be refreshed. Be delighted in your spouse. Be delighted in your children. Well, that's my word to you today. I hope it blessed you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.